Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we'd love to talk to you about your uh, book, Give and Take. Uh, you write in your book that uh, people differ in their preferences for reciprocity, and you divide them into givers, takers, and matchers. Uh, could you perhaps begin by explaining the difference? Sure. So I, I was really struck going into this process by the fact that, that people have different motives when they walk into workplace interactions. And I think you could sort of anchor this at, you know, at two extremes, the takers and the givers. So the takers are people who, when they walk into an interaction with another person, they're trying to get as much as possible from that person and contribute as little as they can in return, thinking that's sort of the shortest and most direct path to achieving their own goals. On the other end of the spectrum, we have this strange breed of people that I call givers, um, not about donating money or volunteering necessarily, but looking to help others maybe by making an introduction or giving advice or providing mentoring or sharing knowledge without many strings attached. And these givers actually prefer to be on the, the contributing end of an interaction. Now, I think very few of us are purely takers or purely givers. Most of us hover somewhere in between. And that brings us really to the third group of people who are matchers. Um, a matcher is basically somebody who tries to maintain an even balance of give and take. So if I help you, I expect you to help me in return. Um, you know, I'll sort of keep score of exchanges so that everything is fair and really just. Right. Now, uh, so, so uh, it seems logical enough based on what you said that research shows that in fields like engineering and medicine that givers end up at the bottom of the heap. Because obviously if you, have a, if you are focused on giving more to others than taking back, uh, then, then it's quite likely that you'll end up at the bottom of the heap. But who ends up at the top of the heap and why? Yeah, that, that was one of the most fascinating questions that I got into when I started doing the research for the book is, you know, you look across a wide range of, of industries and even countries and you find these three styles exist everywhere. And indeed, the, the givers are overrepresented at the bottom. Um, putting other people first, they often put themselves at risk for burning out or being exploited by takers. And so a lot of people look at that and they'll say, well, it's hard for a taker to rise consistently to the top because, you know, oftentimes takers burn bridges. And so it must be the matchers, you know, who are, who are more generous than takers, but also protect their own interests. And when I looked at the data, I was really surprised to see that both of those answers were wrong. It's actually the givers again. Givers are overrepresented over at the top as well as the bottom of most success metrics. Um, I found that in sales, that the most productive salespeople are actually those who put their customers' interests first. And you know, I think a lot of that comes from the trust and the goodwill that they build, but also the reputations that they create. And I guess one of the, the ways that I would play this out is to say that the success of givers and the, the fall of takers is, is often driven by matchers. So a matcher is somebody who, who really believes in a just world. And of course, a taker violates that belief in a just world. Matchers cannot see, stand to see takers get ahead you know, by, by taking advantage of other people. And so the data on this suggests that the matchers will often go around trying to punish them, um, often by gossiping and, and spreading negative reputational information. And just as, as matchers hate seeing takers get away with exploitation, they also hate to see people act really generously and not get rewarded for it. And so matchers will often go out of their way to promote and help and support givers to make sure they actually do get rewarded for their generosity. And I think that's one of the most powerful dynamics behind the rise of givers. Oh, that's great. And one of the things I found most fascinating about your book is the combination of, of very rigorous research uh, with some really compelling stories of both givers and takers. Uh, and, and so uh, among the va various stories you tell, there is one about a person called Peter Odette. Uh, could you tell us uh, that story? And did being a giver help him or hurt him? And what are some of the lessons to be learned? Yeah, absolutely. So I would, I would say yes to all of the above. Um, so, so Peter Odette is, is one of my, my favorite people that I met when I was doing research for the book. He's a financial advisor. And he's the kind of guy who goes out of his way to help everyone that he meets. So for years, he would interview job candidates, and he would only be able to hire one and have to turn everybody else down. And he would often give up his entire afternoon just trying to find jobs for the other people that he couldn't hire himself, and you know, really opening up his personal network to do that. Um, a lot of times, this, this orientation toward helping others sort of got him in trouble. Um, in one particular case, he had a, a colleague um, who ended up calling Brad in the book who essentially was, was getting out of the business and he needed somebody to, to buy his clients quickly. 
And Peter said, sure, I'll do it. And you know, he basically paid about $10,000 for Brad's clients on the spot just to help him out. And then a couple months later, Peter started losing his clients and they disappeared. And he discovered that all of those clients that he was losing were former clients of Brad's that he had bought. And he did a little bit of homework and found out that Brad was back in the business. And he was basically taking his clients back and not paying Peter a dime for them. And it cost Peter a ton of money. And he really got, I think, burned by a taker in that situation. And yet, Peter will tell you, if you talk to him, he's been enormously successful in his career. Um, he runs a, a financial advisor firm that's uh, well, well over seven figures in terms of annual revenue. And he will tell you that being a giver is how he has gotten ahead. It's how he wins business. It's why people go to him. And I think what happens is oftentimes givers put themselves at risk in the short run. But in the long run, they end up building the kind of social capital that's really important for success in a very connected world. And you know you can see this play out in many, many different situations in his career. Uh, one of my favorites was when he actually drove out to visit a, a client in the scrap metal business who was the tiniest of clients worth very, very little money. And Peter's colleagues actually said, don't bother. It's a waste of your time. Um, the drive out there alone is not worth your, your hourly fee. And Peter said, you, know, you can't just ignore somebody because they're not worth your time. I, I really want to help in any way I can. And you know, the, the client turns out not to be a, a scrap metal worker, but the owner of a lucrative scrap metal business. And he multiplies his fees by a, a factor of 100 once he sees what a generous guy Peter is. And I think that, that's one of the things that, that we really learned from Peter is that givers do in the short run sometimes lose. And Peter has gotten better at protecting himself and, and screening to say, you know, is this person a taker, a giver, or a matcher before he determines how much he'll help them. Um, but at the end of the day, he also ends up helping people who he would never expect to be able to help him back, and yet sometimes they do. That's very interesting. That just an act of kindness in going out to see somebody who needed his help uh, multiplied his business manifold. That's a very, very, really very inspiring story. Uh, how do successful givers approach networking, uh, and how does their their approach differ from, say, takers or matchers? So takers tend to actually have incredibly broad networks, in part because when they burn one bridge, they have to go and find new people to exploit in order to get, sort of keep the, the network going. Um, what you find is matchers tend to have much narrower networks because they will typically only exchange with people who have helped them in the past or they, who they expect to be able to help them in the future. And so they end up restricting their, their universe of opportunities. Um, givers tend to, to build much broader networks than matchers, but in a very different way than takers. Um, what givers will typically do when, when they meet somebody new is try to figure out how can I add value to this person's life? And what could I possibly contribute that might benefit this person? Um, and what that typically means is they end up creating a lot of goodwill in the relationships that they build that, that often lies dormant until they may actually need it. Now, how do you spot a faker or a taker in giver's clothing? Uh, that, that was one of my favorite uh, bodies of research that I looked into when writing the book. So I think there are a couple powerful ways to, to spot a taker. Um, one, let, let's start with the corner office. There is a phenomenal study by Chatterjee and Hambrick that looked at over 100 computer companies and actually downloaded the annual reports of each company and tried to figure out, could you identify the taker CEOs without ever meeting them? So they got Wall Street analysts to rate how much is each CEO a taker. And these analysts who knew the CEOs and interacted with them you know, rated the extent to which they were entitled and narcissistic and self-serving. And the first factor that really correlated highly with those ratings was the gap in compensation between the, the CEO and the next highest paid executive. So a typical computer industry CEO makes about two to two and a half times as much annual compensation as the next highest paid executive in that company. The typical taker CEO had about seven times more annual compensation than the next highest paid executive in that company. So literally taking more in terms of compensation. The second cue was looking at their speech. So the takers tended to use first person singular pronouns like I and me, as opposed to us and we when talking about the company. And then the third, my favorite was the takers literally felt it's all about me. I am the most important and central figure in this company. And when you looked at their photos in the company's annual reports, they actually had larger photos, and they were more likely to be pictured alone. And I think that was a third signal. So those signals don't just show up in the corner office, right? There's new research by Keith Campbell and his colleagues suggesting even you can spot these cues on Facebook. 
And one of the easiest ways that you can look for a taker is to look for a pattern that translates from Dutch as basically kissing up, kicking down. So takers tend to be very careful at impression management and ingratiation when they're dealing with someone superior or more influential. But it's hard to keep up the facade in every interaction. And so it's often peers and subordinates who have a, a more direct window into what are this person's true motives really like. You know, what you just said reminds me of a, of a story I read many years ago uh, when Mahatma Gandhi, you know, when, he, when he edited a magazine, he would receive all kinds of letters. And one letter was from a young, young woman who was about to get engaged. Uh, and uh, she was going to meet her you know, prospective uh, fiancé for the first time. And she wanted to know how she could judge this person. And the advice that Mahatma Gandhi gave her in the columns of the, the magazine that he edited was, don't look at how he treats you, look at how he treats his servants. Uh, and, and, and I think that's very, very telling in terms of, because with, with somebody whom he was trying to impress, obviously he would, uh, you know, he would be very well behaved. But a true sign of character is how you treat people who are vulnerable. I, I think that's a really profound observation. And, you know, I think there's a famous quote attributed to Samuel Johnson that the, the true measure of a person is how he treats someone who can do him or her no good. Exactly, exactly. Now, I, you also point out that givers and takers are very, uh, differ quite a bit in the way they approach collaboration uh, and, and sharing credit. Uh, can you give any examples of uh, how, how this works out? Yeah, so I think that this is one of the most interesting dynamics you could, you could really look at. So in, in doing the research for the book, I used some historical examples here that I found fascinating. Uh, one was Frank Lloyd Wright who at one point discovered as an architect that his, uh, his draftsmen were essentially getting more commissions and more work than he was because essentially customers and clients found them easier to work with and every bit as talented. And he was offended by this and, and felt that you know, they should be subservient to him. So he actually set a policy that they were not allowed to accept independent commissions. And if while working in his studio, they did any work even if he never touched it, his name had to be signed first. And you know, I think that obviously that cost him a lot of very, very talented draftspeople. And if you look at his legacy, he really mentored and championed far fewer great art architects than, than most who achieved similar stature did. Uh, another example that I think really stands out from history is, is Jonas Salk, who's really remembered as, as a hero. Uh, for discovering and, and sort of commercializing a polio vaccine. But if you look at Salk's behavior really closely, one of the things you'll see is he never gave credit to any of the, the people in his lab who helped him discover the vaccine and actually caused the, the team to fracture and splinter. Um, Salk never made a discovery that was nearly as, as influential again. And I think this is one of the costs of appearing like a taker in a collaboration, right, is slighting other people who might deserve credit. What givers tend to do in collaboration is assume that credit is not zero sum. And if I give you credit for your contributions, that doesn't necessarily take away from my contribution. And that makes it a lot easier to keep people on board in a team over time. It means typically that if you're a leader or a manager, people will follow you if you rotate to a different organization or a different job. And I think that that's, that's really powerful, but often harder to do. Great. Now, you also have a very interesting reason you give why Salk didn't give credit to his team. Uh, and, and, and there was a certain bias at work. Could you, could you explain that? That's very fascinating. Yeah, the, the, so this, this comes out of social and cognitive psychology. So the, the immediate thinking is, well, you know, if, if Salk were a taker, he would be motivated to put his best foot forward. And so he would trumpet his accomplishments and really dismiss those of, of people around him. And yet, Ross and colleagues have shown consistently that these kinds of biases are less about our desires to paint ourselves in the most flattering light and actually more about information. That there's a discrepancy between what we know about our own contributions and those of others. So in Salk's case, he remembered the blood, the sweat, the tears that he put in moment by moment when he was working toward creating that, that polio vaccine that saved thousands and possibly millions of lives. He literally couldn't remember the contributions of his colleagues because he wasn't there a lot of the time, right? He, he didn't actually experience them. 
And this is really the discrepancy that exists. Um, Eugene Caruso and his colleagues have done some really powerful research showing that when people are just asked to list the contributions of their team members and their own, they're literally more able to remember their own contributions. And I think that's one of the big factors that drives credit biases in collaboration. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for any manager or even a teacher is identifying the so-called diamonds in the rough. You know, people who have the potential uh, to 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 become to do great things as they go forward. Uh, how can you tell us a little bit about how a legendary teacher uh, uh, does this in, in your book? Absolutely. So there's an accounting professor at the University of North Carolina and Duke by the name of C.J. Skender. Um, the man has taught over 35,000 students in his career. He's won every teaching award on the planet. And he has a remarkable gift for bringing out the best in his students. He's had many, many students win gold medals, both in his state and nationally, for their accounting achievements. He's had more than three dozen students follow him to become professors of accounting. And when you look at his approach, the question is, how does he do it? A lot of people assume that he's got a great eye for talent and that he's immediately able to spot the quantitative savants and then basically work with them. And CJ says, no, it's the exact opposite. He sees every student who walks into his classroom as a diamond in the rough, waiting to be polished. And then what he does is he tries to make his classes as interesting as possible to bring out the best in those students. Now, of course, it doesn't work with every student. But what he finds over time is by making his material interesting that he does shift some people toward becoming more motivated and more hardworking. And this is true, I think, of, of coaches and leaders and managers everywhere. If you look at, at research by Benjamin Bloom and his colleagues of what made somebody a world-class tennis player or a world-class musician or even a mathematician or a scientist of, of great acclaim, very rarely were those world-class candidates superior early on in their careers. Um, they looked pretty average when you started with them. But what they had in common was a coach, a teacher, or a manager who believed in them and set their aspirations very high. And then that often created a self-fulfilling prophecy by inspiring them to, to engage in more deliberate practice and to put in the 10,000 hours that we all know are critical to achieving expertise. You know, another really fascinating part of your book deals with what you call powerless communication. What does that? What, what does exactly? What, what does that mean? And how is it useful in persuading and influencing others? So I'll give you my own personal example of this. Um, when I was 25 and I had first started teaching, I was asked to to teach a leadership and motivation course uh, for uh, for senior leaders in the U.S. Air Force. And I was about half their age, and I had just finished my doctorate, and I had relatively little experience. And I felt like what I had to do was speak in you know, the most confident possible tone to really establish my credibility. And so I came in and I, I walked through all my credentials and described sort of what my training was, and then we, we went through the session. And afterward, I got the, the course feedback. And you know, it, was, it was pretty depressing, to say the least. Uh, one of the comments that, that really got burned into my brain was that there was more knowledge uh, in the audience than on the podium. And there were other people who made comments like, you know, gosh, the professors get younger every year. And, you know, how could this guy really teach us to lead? He's never been a leader. And, you know, I, I sat back and thought about that and realized that perhaps the, the confident, dominant, powerful approach was not the best path to influence. And I decided to open up with a, a slightly different approach, which is I walked into the, the next class that I had to teach for that same audience in the Air Force. And I said, OK, my name's Adam Grant. I know what all of you are thinking right now. What can I possibly learn from a professor who's 12 years old? <laughs> and then I just waited. And you know, after a few seconds, everybody started laughing. And, and one of the Air Force colonels said, no, 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 that's way off. I'm sure you're at least 13. <laughs> and you know, that became sort of a running joke throughout the session. And I, I think what I, had, I guess what I, what I learned from that experience was that sometimes humility and vulnerability in communication, um, what you might think of as powerless communication, is actually a, a stronger way to connect with your audience. And there's a lot of research on this. There's a classic study by Elliot Aronson called, on the pratfall effect, where um, quiz bowl uh, competitors are recorded and you get to listen to them, and you hear an expert. And when the expert spills coffee all over himself, you actually like him more. It humanizes him. It gives you an authentic connection with him. And I think that's a lot of the power of powerless communication. Uh, what can givers do to avoid burnout 
and also to avoid becoming doormats. It seems those are two pretty big risks for people who see themselves as givers. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, in a way, being a matcher is a safer strategy. I think that you know, knowing that givers end up at the bottom and the top means there are some risks associated with it. But I think that those risks actually can be mitigated with, with careful strategies. So I think a, a lot of it comes down to setting boundaries. So many givers confuse being helpful or being generous with being available for every person and every quest, request all the time. Um, there are other givers who confuse perhaps you know, being generous with empathizing and dropping everything that you're doing to help others. Um, and I think there are also plenty of givers out there, this is something I found over and over in my research, who feel like it's uncomfortable or inappropriate to advocate for their own interests. And I think that we need to, we need to work with, with people who sort of fall on the giving end of the spectrum to help them set clear boundaries and determine, okay, how am I going to help most of the people most of the time? Uh, one of my favorite concepts that I, I came across when doing the background research for the book is, is what's called the five-minute favor, uh, which is basically instead of just helping everyone all the time, thinking about, okay, can I offer something of unique value to this other person that will take me five minutes or less? And you know, I think it's, it's basically about finding high benefit to others, but low cost to the self ways of contributing. Right. You know, normally people believe that the alternative to being selfish, which is what, uh, you know, the trait that takers usually have, is being selfless. But you've come up with uh, uh, another term called otherish. Could you explain the difference? Yeah, so when I first started studying give and take, I thought that, that basically self-interest versus sort of selflessness were on one spectrum. And you had takers over here who were very, you know, very selfish, you had givers who were very selfless. And it actually turns out, if you look at the data on this, that you can more effectively draw a two by two and say concern for your own interests and concern for other people's interests are actually independent motivations. So you could score low and high on one or on both. So the takers tend to be purely selfish. Um, there's one group of givers who's purely selfless, who constantly put other people's interests ahead of their own. But there's this other group of givers that I call otherish, who are concerned about benefiting others, but they also keep their own interests in the rear view mirror. And so they will look for ways to help others that are either low cost to themselves or even high benefit to themselves, i.e. win-win as opposed to win-lose. Here's the irony. The selfless givers might be more altruistic in principle, right? Because they're, they're constantly elevating other people's interests ahead of their own. But my data and, and research by lots of others show that they're actually less generous because they run out of energy, they run out of time, and they lose their resources because they don't basically take enough care of themselves. The otherish givers are able to sustain their giving by looking for ways that giving can hurt them less or benefit them more. So the, the vulnerabilities that you identified earlier of burnout and being a doormat is actually uh, something that affects selfless givers more than others. That's right. Yeah, selfless givers are at much greater risk of burnout and exploitation than are the otherish givers. Right. Well, uh, one final question, Adam. Uh, what practical advice, apart from reading your book, uh, could you offer people who want to start applying the, these principles to their own lives? So I think there, there's lots of advice sort of peppered throughout the book in different chapters. But when I take a step back, I, I think the first question is, what is your own style? Um, if you go to the, the Give and Take website, giveandtake.com, there's a self-assessment that you can take there. There's also a 360 assessment, both available for free, where you can get other people to rate you. And I think that's really the first step, is to f hold up a mirror and figure out, OK, what is my default? Um, I may act more like a taker when I'm negotiating a big contract. I may act more like a giver when I'm in a mentoring role. And I'm probably a matcher when a colleague from another organization approaches me for some specialized knowledge. But how do I treat most of the people most of the time, I think, is the first step. And then I think you know, the second step is there are some surprising opportunities, both for success and for meaning, in operating like a giver. And so I would ask, OK, what are the types of giving that you find most energizing or most consistent with your skills? Um, for some people, it's making introductions. For others, it's sharing credit. For others, it's stepping up as a mentor. And I think finding your own sort of giver style is really powerful. And you know, I think the, the real meaning and purpose associated with that is that you know, even if givers don't always do better than takers or matchers, they manage to succeed in ways that make others better and lift others up instead of cutting them down. And I think looking for ways to do that is probably the, the most sustainable path to success in the long term, both for individuals and organizations.
Adam, thank you so much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.